the fact that when you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to remember the lies you told in the past. Have you ever told a lie and then you go, oh, I forgot I told that lie? One of the things that I have been trying to get across to this congregation and anyone that will listen is success is not measured by your bank account. Success is not measured by the toys you have. Success is not measured by the degrees that you have behind your name. Success is measured by your relationship with God and your relationship with others. If you want to have a successful life on this earth, you need to measure your relationships with others and your relationship with God. And if you're here today, my prayer for you is that number one, your relationship with God will be where it needs to be. But if it's not, you can make those changes today. And the other thing is I hope and my prayer is that as you grow in your relationships with God, you will grow in your relationships with others. And by doing so, when your time has come and you are going to judgment, you will be able to say, I was success because I had a good relationship with God and I had a good relationship with others. That's what I want to talk to you about, and that's the reason why we're doing this series of lessons on discipleship. We're doing this series of lessons because I want you as believers, people who love God and honor God, I want you to have the best relationships with other people because it is through relationships that we are able to go off into the world. So, Today, let's talk about wise relationships. James chapter 3 and verse 18 that was just read to you just a few moments ago says, Blessed, or, or says, the peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. I want you to underline those words, raise a harvest of righteousness. Because one of the things we as Christians are needing to do in this world today more than ever is we need to have a harvest of righteousness. Amen? But the question is, is how do we do that? How do we be the peacemakers? How, do, how are we going to be the people of this earth that are going to raise that harvest of righteousness? We're going to do it through wise relationship. And one of the things I want you to understand is that wisdom is not your learning style. I know for a lot of times I thought wise people just had a lot of knowledge. And I wanted more and more knowledge. But wisdom is not your learning style. It's not how much you know. It is your lifestyle. It is your lifestyle. It says in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? He's asking the question, how do you know if somebody's wise and has true understanding? How do you know if they are on track in doing the right thing? He says, let him show it by his good life. And that's the key to wisdom right there. But you need to also understand a lack of wisdom will cause all kinds of problems. You need to know that if you don't have wisdom in your life, it's going to cause problems. In, 14, in uh, verses 14 through 16, it says, Bitter envy and selfish am uh, ambition. And I want you to understand that those are the things that cause problems in your marriage. Those are the things that cause problems at work. They are the things that cause problems with your family as well as with anybody else that you have relationships with. And so I, I'm going to just go ahead and just tell you right off the bat that none of us in here are really great at relationships. None of us are. We all mess up. We all have shortcomings. And the reason why I'm preaching on this is more for me than it is for you. So, if you get some on you, that's a bonus. But I want you to know today that if you lack wisdom in your relationship, James chapter 3 tells us that if you lack wisdom, let you sh he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it would be given to him. 
You need to know that if you lack re relational wisdom, you can ask God for help in this. A lot of people think, well, I'm not good at relationships. I'm not like Neil. Neil's gregarious. That, and that is my personality. But that does not mean I'm good at relationships. I've known gregarious people who are terrible at relationships. And I've also known people who are shy that are great at relationships. What makes you good at relationships is God, not just yourself and not just your personality. And when you follow God's rules for relationships, you will get good at them. So open up your lesson notes because I've got some don'ts that you need to learn for people who are relationally wise. I, I've got them down in your notes. I've got six of them here, and I, I know there's more, but I want to just go over these, these six today. The very first one is don't compromise your integrity. Don't compromise your integrity. And what we mean by that is people need to be able to trust you. If they can't trust you, then you're not going to ever have any relationships. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right now, there are people that I don't trust that I know. There are people in this congregation that I don't trust. And the reason why I don't trust them is they don't have integrity. They will tell you one thing and then go do something else. They will show you something and then do something else behind your back. And I'm going to tell you that is because if people can't trust you, you can't have a relationship with them. And you need to understand that most people in the world today like to lie. Amen? As a matter of fact... I hear it all the time in the world today where people tell me that they said a lie, they did this or they did that, and then they laugh about it like they've pulled something on somebody. You need to be a person of integrity. What does it say? Wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. 1 John chapter 3 in verse 3 says, Everyone has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure talking about jesus i'm going to tell you if you grew up in the culture of today lying has been one of those things that you've just done most of your life as a matter of fact a lot of us when it comes to lying and telling the truth we don't always do it because it's just become human nature for us and Jesus says, or the Bible says here, that if you want to have integrity, you've got to be like Jesus. You've got to be pure. And it's an ongoing thing. It's an ongoing battle to tell the truth and to be truthful. Now, James is a lot like the book of Proverbs. As a matter of fact, I believe James is the wisdom book of the New Testament. And we spend a lot of time in Proverbs. As a matter of fact, I spent so much time in Proverbs, I just don't even want to get out of it anymore. So I put this in here in your lesson notes, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19. The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked path will be found out. And I love that verse because the fact that when you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to remember the lies you told in the past. H have you ever told a lie and then you go, oh, I forgot I told that lie. Y'all are laughing because this happened to you, hasn't it? This is uncomfortable, isn't it? I'm telling you it's uncomfortable because we do have a tendency not to show our integrity. And one of the things that the Proverbs writer is telling us here is a man of integrity walks securely. If I tell the truth all the time, I don't have to worry about fi somebody finding out that I'm telling a lie. I don't have to remember what lie I told anyone. I can just be insecure in the fact that I'm walking the same way all the time. The second thing is you don't want to antagonize others. You don't want to antagonize others. Have you ever been around that person that just antagonizes you the whole time? I, I was working with a teenage boy, boy and thankfully... Thankfully, he got over this, but this particular teen, teenage boy was rebellious at the time, and all he wanted to do was antagonize me. If I said it was black, he said it was white. 
If I said the sky was blue, he would say it was purple. And he did that for a number of months when we got together. And the reason why he did that is he was in complete rebellion against anything that I stood for. And he thought that was the best way for him to do it. Thankfully, he's turned from that, but he's not, and he's not doing that anymore. But look what it says. It says, wisdom is peace-loving. Wisdom is peace-loving. I've known people personally who have a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety in their life. They always have some kind of turmoil going on. And if your life is in turmoil all the time, I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. Some people like turmoil. And you may be married to somebody who likes turmoil. Or you may be that person that likes turmoil. You know, if you hit your head against the wall long enough, it's going to feel normal. And some people have had so much turmoil in their life, they don't know how not to have the chaos. And I have seen it over and over again in people's life. And I've actually asked people from time to time, why do you want to live that way? And their response to me is, I've always lived this way. So don't antagonize others. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse uh, 3 says, It is an honor for a man to stay out of a fight. Only fools insist on quarreling. If you're in a quarrelsome marriage, if you're in a quarrelsome relationship with someone, you might want to look at the next three things that I've got here because these are the things that start quarrels. These are the things that start fights. The first thing is, is comparing. Comparing, and I want you to write next to comparing in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. And, and the kind of comparing that I'm talking about is when you compare your children. When, when you compare your spouse to someone else. When you compare your current spouse to your first husband. That's a no-no, by the way. When you start comparing yourself to other people, let, let, me, let me just point this out. I'm looking at you right now, and, you know, some of you are prettier than others. I'm just saying. And, and guess what? Some of you are smarter than others. Don't be hitting yourself on the chest, Logan. I wasn't talking about you. I saw that. And guess what? Some of you are older than others. And I'm so thankful that there's some of you in here that are older than me because I'm starting to get to the top end of that. You hear what I'm saying? We're all different. And guess what? I'm going to tell you a secret. God created us that way. He didn't create all of you to look like me. Thank goodness. Some of you could have used some help, though. I'm going to tell you. And whoever's in the back catcalling needs to cut it out because I'll come after you. Okay? Here, here, here's what I want you to know. You can't compare yourself with others and don't compare each other with each other. Quit comparing. Number two, or letter B, condemning others whoa that's a problem we have in the church amen we want to condemn the world we want to condemn our brothers and sisters we look at each other and we see a speck in their eye and we won't take the moat out of our eye we are so good at condemning it is a natural tendency for us as human beings to be able to condemn it's easier for us to find what's wrong with the situation than it is to find what's right with the situation and let her see contradicting others and i'm going to tell you i have a problem with all of this that we're talking about today when somebody starts telling a story and they are telling it wrong, I want to contradict them. It's hard. When Nancy and I are together, and, and uh, I, Nancy says it's my memory, but I think it's her memory. 
It's, it's kind of one of those things that we're, you know, we, have, we have to write it down so that we both have the same facts. But sometimes Nancy will be telling a story and I'm like, no, you got it wrong. And it's all I can do to keep my mouth shut. And sometimes, no matter how hard I try, my mouth opens by itself and words come out. You guys are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You stay married long enough, it will happen to you. There is a tendency. Now, I, I'm, I'm telling you this. If, if somebody is about to take the wrong medicine that's going to kill them, go ahead and contradict them. But when it doesn't matter, guess what? Let it go. As a matter of fact, I told you before I'm writing a song, but I think Disney has a problem with it. Just let it go. Look at what it says here. A wise man controls his temper. He knows that anger causes mistakes. I want you to underline those words because if you're like me, you know that anger will cause mistakes. Anger is a human, human emotion that we all have. You're going to be angry at some time or another. You're going to have a problem at one time or another where you're just going to be frustrated and it's going to make you mad. But you need to watch and you need to heed this. Your anger will cause you to make mistakes. We were talking about this a little bit in the discipleship class this morning and it reminded me of a story. One Sunday morning, I was on my way to church and I was running a little bit later than I normally did and I had to teach class. This is long before I became a preacher, uh, so, you, you know, I made a lot of mistakes back then. I'm still making some, but th this was when I was young, and we were on our way, and I was in a hurry. Have you ever been in a hurry somewhere, and that one person gets in front of you that doesn't want to drive? It happens. It's happened to me this past week. But I'm on my way to church. i got to teach class. I'm getting stressed i got to get there so I can get prepped and I can get ready. And i got Nancy in the car, and I'm behind this person, and they are going 10 miles under the speed limit. And I'm not doing anything but getting more and more tense and more and more frustrated until I see a spot that I can blow by them. And I hit that spot. And I zoom, and I sped the rest of the way to church. But as we sped past them, Nancy says, you do know that was one of our elders you just passed. <laughs> oh, y'all think it's funny now. <laughs> Number three, don't minimize others. Don't minimize others. When, when I told you just a few moments ago, some of us are smarter than others, some of us are better looking than others, some of us have more money than others, some of us are older than others, and we have a tendency to minimize people. We minimize them because we don't respect them. And, and one of the things we do is we minimize the feelings of others. This is something that I struggle with. If, if Carrie Pomerinke comes to me and she says, you know, I'm really sad about this. And I'm not sad about it. I'll say, oh, Carrie, you don't need to be sad about that. We have a tendency to minimize the feelings of others. What we tend to do is we tend to make ourselves the standard. And that's okay if we feel like others are above us or others are better than us. And as I put it before, when it comes to humility, having that humility where we treat others as the honored guests, that's okay. But most of the time, we treat people as beneath us, that they're not as educated as us, they're not as bright as us, they're not as handsome as us, they're not as wealthy as us, and we have that tendency to minimize them. Wisdom is considerate. Wisdom is considerate. Proverbs 15, verse 4 says, Gentle words cause life and health. Griping brings discouragement. Number four, don't criticize others. 
I want you to take a test. I want you to underline number four. Because I think in our society, in our culture, we have a tendency to criticize others. We have a tendency to look at others and think they're doing a terrible job. Now, you don't think that's true? Try politics right now. You don't think that's true? Try the coach of your favorite team that just lost yesterday. We have no idea. We have no idea what it's like to be in those shoes. But as a society, we tend to be armchair quarterbacks. We tend to be armchair politicians. And we tend to think we know better than anybody else. So it's okay for us to criticize. I'm telling you this is because this bleeds over into the church. Now, look at it says, wisdom is submissive. And, and I want you to just take that word submissive and put an X to it. Because that's not what that Greek word means right there. That's one of the areas that they put in there, and it kind of means that. But the idea is, is that it's, and it comes from the Re Revised Standard Version, is open to reason is what it really kind of means. Is I'm going to be reasonable about things. And, and then the other translation, and I think that's the Living Bible, says it allows for discussion. And what I'm trying to get at here is instead of criticizing everything, what we need to do is we need to be able to listen. First, seek to understand and then be understood if you're a Stephen Covey fan. We need to spend more time listening than we do criticizing what's going on. Proverbs 12, 15 says, A fool thinks he needs no advice but a wise man listens to others. We need to hear the facts. We need to understand the story. We need to know the motives. And in knowing all of that, it gives us a better picture of what's going on around us. Number five, don't emphasize the mistakes of others. Don't emphasize the mistakes of others. I'm going to tell you, I, I don't know whether this is therapy for me or just so you guys can know, but when I was younger, I, I was a mess. When I was a teenager, I was a mess. And uh, one of my favorite sayings to my brothers was, you'd mess up a sack lunch. They do something dumb, I just look at them, you know, you'd mess up a sack lunch. And I don't know how many times I've said it, but it must have been, well over a hundred. Well, one day I went to school and I got my lunch bag out and uh, my mom was packing my lunch back then. And I got my lunch bag out and I said, there's no sandwich in here. What happened to a sandwich? Got home, I said, mom, you messed up a sack lunch. You forgot to put my sandwich in there. And she says, no, I put it in there. I made everybody the same. My older brother, who was bigger than me, he got a whole bag of sandwiches. I got one. But, but the thing of it is, is I was just, I was defiant. Mom, you messed up my, no, son, I put it in there. You need to go look in your car. And sure enough, I got to my car. The sandwich had rolled out of the bag, and it was in the floor. So I messed up a sack lunch. Now, I'm just going to tell you, for every time I said to my brothers, you'd mess up a sack lunch, guess how many times I heard, Neil, you messed up a sack lunch. It got so old that I moved out when I was 17. Not really. I was 18 when I moved out. But my point being is you get tired of people telling the same thing about you do you have a friend in your life that they remind you of something that you did when you were younger that was dumb 
Do you have people in your life that will not forget the mistakes you've made? I heard a story about two men who were at a hotel and they got to talking one night. And their wives had gone up to their room and they were just, you know, they said, we're in the lobby. They weren't doing anything wrong. They were just talking. And they looked at their watches and it was three o'clock in the morning. They said, oh, we got to get up there. Our wives are going to be mad the next morning. The two of them got down there and they were seeing each other. And one of them said, well, how did your wife take it? And, well, she was pretty upset. And the other one said, well, what about yours? He said, well, my wife became historical. And he said, don't you mean hysterical? He says, no, historical. She's told me everything I've done wrong my whole life. <laughs> the point being is we don't need to emphasize the mistakes of others. We all make mistakes. Amen? How many of you in here have made a mistake? Just raise your hand. Those of you who are not raising your hands are making a mistake right now. All right. Wisdom is full of mercy and good fruit. Proverbs 17, 9. Love forgets mistake, but nagging about them parts the best of friends. Number six. And this is real important for those of you who are in life groups or in relationships where you are trying to become a better Christian. Don't disguise your weakness. Don't disguise your weakness. If you disguise your weakness, people will see you as a phony eventually. If you struggle in an area, let people know you struggle in the area. One of the reasons why we have life groups is because we want you to have a safe place to talk about your struggles. There is nothing more important to the Christian walk than to have someone that you can connect with, that you can talk about your struggles so that you can overcome them, so that you can become better at what you're working on. And when you have somebody that you can be accountable to, you can do better with your struggles. It says, wisdom is impartial and sincere, not a phony. Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. Look at that right there. Just underline that. A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. How many men in here have a hard time admitting your mistakes. The rest of you have just made another mistake. There is something inside of us that we do not want to admit that we have messed up. Now, I don't know about women on this issue, but I do know about men. Men will have a thousand excuses before they'll ever say, I messed up. As a matter of fact, just as practice right now, all the men of the congregation just all at once say with me, I messed up, okay? If you will learn to say that, you will have a better relationship with your wife, you'll have a better relationship with your kids, you'll have better relationships with your employers. We're all going to make mistakes, amen? And just learn to own it. It says in Proverbs 28, verse 13, a man who refuses his mistakes can never be successful. But, but if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. He gets another chance. And how many of us in here need another chance? Well, I want you to test yourself on these six points. Do you compromise your integrity? Do you antagonize others? Do you minimize others? Do you criticize others? Do you emphasize the mistakes of others? Are you disguising the weaknesses that you have? I, I took this test when I was writing this sermon, and I'm going to tell you I failed in every single category at some point. But I'm so thankful for God's Word because it's, it tells me 
even though I have failed in some points, that I can get better and I need to keep trying. We had a, a terrific Bible class this morning and, and Jan was bringing up 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 to 11. And it was talking about how we need to add to our faith. And it talks about increasing measure of these things. I, I'm going to tell you this, while I took the test and I failed in some of these areas, or all of these areas basically I failed in, I've gotten a lot better in these areas than I have been in the past. And my goal and my joy in all of this is that I'm going to keep trying to get better and better and be better at relationships. But I'm gonna tell you this, if you're trying to do it on your own without Christ, you're never gonna make it. Look at the passage I've got down in here for the invitation. Colossians 2, verses 2 through 3. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mysteries of God, namely Christ. And underline these words, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you want wisdom and knowledge, you need to be in Christ. Amen? I heard a great story this morning on the way to the building. I, I listened to uh, the, the different preachers throughout the week. And this one particular preacher this morning I was listening to, I, I don't get a sermon on Sunday morning, so I have to listen to somebody else's on the way in. But I was listening to this particular preacher, and he was talking about this church. It's here in Florida. I don't know exactly where. But he went over, and it was a predominantly black church. And he was looking over the, the uh, thing they hand out to their visitors, and they had all the staff members. And all of the staff members on there were all black except for one. And he says, well, you know, tell me about this guy. He says, great story. This guy was in the Ku Klux Klan. And now he's on staff at a black church? He says, yeah, he was going to become the chaplain for the Ku Klux Klan. I didn't even know they had such a thing. But he decided, if I'm going to be the chaplain, I need to know my Bible. So he started reading the Bible. And as he was starting to read the Bible, the Word of God got in him. And he realized that what he was doing with his life was wrong. And he went to this church, this particular church, and told his story to them as a way of repenting. And he loved them so much, and they loved him so much, that they put him on staff. And I'm going to tell you this, the only way that kind of hate, that kind of anger, that kind of division can be eradicated is in Jesus Christ. We can try to legislate morality. We can make another law. We can delete a law because everybody's doing it. We can hold protest out front. But the only way that people are ever going to come to know what we know about God is through Christ Jesus. And you may be here today and you may have been baptized into Christ and you may have put on Christ, but there are things in your life that have kept you from being all that you can be in Christ. And if it's something public that you need to repent of, we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward and repent. If it's something private that you need to repent of, then you can repent in your seat. But please don't leave here unchanged. Because if you leave here unchanged, that means you really haven't worshipped. And it may be that you're here today and you've never put on Christ in baptism and we want you to make that decision. God wants you to make that decision. 
And he wants you to make that decision to follow him so that you can be with him forever. Monty Betts challenged me to do some study on heaven, and I have been doing that in my personal study. And I've always struggled with heaven, what it looks like, what it's going to be like. I don't know. I don't think all the study in the world is going to give me a clearer picture. But I always have had a clear picture of hell. I've never struggled with hell. It's a place I don't want to go. I don't, I, I really, you know, unless somebody's joking or something, I've yet to hear a single person say, you know, I'm really looking forward to hell. All of us should want to be in heaven. And the only way we can get there it's through Jesus Christ. And if you're not in Christ, your chances of getting there are zero. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. And my prayer my heart is for you to be in heaven with me and some of you are thinking well heaven's going to be great because Neil won't be preaching anymore <laughs> and I think it's going to be great because I won't have to preach anymore but whatever it is your reason for going to heaven make sure you're there the lesson is yours as we stand and sing